Let's rank Motley Crue's nine studio albums from worst to best. As always, we'll remind you that worst doesn't necessarily mean bad, and that our opinions could change in a year, in a week, or the next time we hear one of their songs on the radio. We'll start with 1997's Generation Swine, which found the group reuniting with original singer Vince Neil after a five-year split. The only problem was, they also tinkered a bit too much with their original sound, or, as Vince bluntly told Cleveland's The Plain Dealer years later, it was a terrible record, because there was too much experimenting. Okay, moving on. Three years later, with drummer Tommy Lee now the one temporarily out of the band, Motley Crue released 2000's new tattoo. It was a welcome return to their sleazy brand of rock and roll, but the songwriting wasn't consistent enough to knock any of the following albums further down this chart. After nearly two decades of lineup changes, retirements, and general chaos, 2008's Saints of Los Angeles finally found the original lineup together on a record and working in the right direction. It's a little bit unfocused, but songs like Mother of the Year and the title track recount the band's history with a satisfyingly bare-knuckle approach. The band's self-titled 1994 album is the only one that doesn't feature Vince Neil on vocals. It shows off an earthier, less glammy version of their sound, displaying impressive range and depth. Oh, and it rocks to high heaven. Too bad not enough people gave this one a chance when it came out. Alright, now we're into the first five records, and the best five. First up is 1985's Theater of Pain, where the band achieved global stardom by using a slightly lighter, pop-friendly touch than on their first two albums with songs like Home Sweet Home and their cover of Smokin' in the Boys' Room. Just two years later, the crew kept their winning streak going with Girls, 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 which brought just the right amount of dirt and grit back into the mix, and was home to massive hits such as the title track and Wild Side. How do you improve on a one-two punch like that? By bringing in mega producer Bob Rock, who helped the band pump up their sound and tighten their songwriting to create their most popular album, 1989's Dr. Feelgood. It had enough hit singles to make Justin Bieber jealous without the album ever, you know, sucking like his records do. Dr. Feelgood might be Motley Crue's finest display of craftsmanship, but it can't quite beat out the unfiltered rush we still get from listening to their raw and randy 1981 debut, Too Fast for Love. You can call it too punk or too sloppy, but we call it our second favorite Motley Crue album. And the only one better was its immediate follow-up, 1983's Shout at the Devil. It has all the energy of its predecessor, plus about five times the muscle, and it also features the band's strongest display of songwriting. More than 30 years later, a big chunk of the band's live shows is still devoted to songs from this fantastic album. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube page, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and check out more of the best in classic rock coverage on ultimateclassicrock.com.